Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and uh, finally I have some information, specific information to share with you about this SPRINT trial and the cardiology business, they love those acronyms. And So the SPRINT trial made headlines when researchers reported not too long ago that aggressive lowering of systolic blood pressure to lower than 120 instead of the current 140 to 150 guidelines reduced the risk of heart disease and strokes so much that they had to stop the study early. It was considered unethical to withhold the aggressive treatment to the, from the rest of the patients. Now, no data were released at the time, but I predicted that when the details were finally released, they would be a whole lot less spectacular than the way they were reported in the media. And uh, you can go back and read Informed Weekly, September 28, 2015 is when I wrote that article. Well, the results, the results were reported at an American Heart Association meeting and published in the New England Journal of Medicine at about the same time. The study involved, and here are the details, there were 9,361 hypertension patients aged 50 and older, uh, followed for an average of 3.2 years. The patients also had at least one other factor for heart disease, such as high cholesterol or smoked, for example, or they had kidney disease or they were over the age of 75. Now, half were assigned to a group that um, uh, established systolic blood pressure target of 140. In other words, the status quo the way it is right now. The other half were assigned to an intervention group with more aggressive medication, and the target was dropped to 120. Um, these patients took an average of one more drug per day than the others, 2.8 pills a day versus 1.8 uh, prior to the start of the study. Now, the study was supposed to run uh, until 2017, but as I mentioned earlier, it was halted because of the spectacular results. And here is how they were reported, and then I'm going to give you a comparison as to what the data really show. The study showed that there were 26% fewer deaths and 38% fewer cases of heart failure in those who lowered their systolic pressure to 120 than those who remained at the current target of 140. The researchers reported that older patients did just as well as younger ones on the aggressive meds, and um, it's estimated that 17 million Americans will be affected by the findings of this study. So this is going to be a bonanza for cardiologists and drug companies. But details um, of the benefits and side effects um, are, uh, of the more aggressive treatment just don't support the enthusiasm of the media and the cardiology profession. So. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize here. I have all the hairy little details in the article, which will be posted in the Health Brace Library, and reciting a lot of numerical details sometimes can, you just get lost in that. So I'm going to give you the summary here. So we had about 4,680 patients in each study. There were 210 deaths in the control group, 155 in the intervention group. Um, what this really comes down to in absolute terms is 0.0117%, a little over 1% um, uh, deaths, uh, drop in deaths. Then there were 100 cases of heart failure in the control group, 62 in the intervention group. This is a little less than 1%, 0.0081%, 0 0.0081%, 8 tenths of 1% drop. Okay, so you can see why I'm not so jumping up and down with excitement over all of this. Um, Overall, 24% reduction in heart attack, stroke, fail, heart failure, death from heart disease. That's how it was reported. The absolute data showed uh, that there was a drop of a little over a half a percent. So now let me summarize that for you. The bottom line, there was a slightly greater than 1% reduction in deaths, slightly less than 1% lower incidence of heart failure, and about one half percent decrease in events overall. Um, that certainly doesn't sound like something that's so earth-shattering. We need to stop this. We should have stopped the study early. Wait till you hear, hear this because of the side effects. In return for the underwhelming results, there was a 5% incidence of side effects, uh, serious complications, which included blood pressure so low it caused severe dizziness or fainting, electrolyte imbalances, and damage to the kidneys. The incidence of serious complications in the control group was 2.5%. In spite of this, the principal investigator stated, quote, it seems that the benefits outweigh the risks. I mean, it just defies logic that we were looking at the same study. This happens again and again where I look at the enthusiasm that's generated over something. I'm looking at the original study and thinking, did this pe these people even read this thing? Now, I'm not the only person who's not enthused about the results. Dr. Michael Alderman at Albert Einstein College of Medicine says that a thousand people would have to be aggressively treated in order for six people to avoid a heart attack, stroke, or heart failure. Now, based on the study, 50 would experience serious complications, 6 would benefit. 
And so the next step is supposedly the Heart Association is going to turn these findings into new guidelines for treating people with high blood pressure. But several cardiologists have said, you know, they're going to start doing this even before the new guidelines are issued. And so what we have here is a typical scenario in today's medicine. Treatments that harm more people than they help are enthusiastically embraced by doctors who seem oblivious to the consequences of their decisions in terms of how they affect the general population. Um, billions of dollars are then spent on treatments that harm more people than they help. And it drives up the costs of medical expense, not only to give the treatments, but then the side effects from the treatment. You know, you're going to have six people benefit out of every 1,000 and 50 that are going to require a lot more medical care as a result. And so the madness isn't going to stop until more people just say no. We have just got to say no to this type of insanity because it is insanity. All right, so while we're talking about insanity, um, it, and it extends to the psychological profession again and again, but I actually have some hopeful news here. It, it, all of this is hopeful news if we act on it, all right? And we cannot wait for the medical profession to act on it. Citizens need to act on it. Let's take our health back, people. Let's take our health back and get it away from these disease-mongering, opportunistic healthcare professionals and the drug companies that employ them. All right, so enough of that rant. Um, suicide, devastating to families and communities and affects people from all walks of life. I mean, homeless people who are in despair kill themselves and famous and rich people like Robin Williams who seem like they have everything to live for and every resource available kill themselves. Um, commentary in the media often focuses on the need for psychiatric care when most of these people are under the care of psychiatrists at the time that they do it. Robin Williams was, and there's an article in the Health Priest Library documenting that. So um, it's well known for a long time, has been well known for a long time, that taking the drugs increases the risk of suicidal ideation. Now, cognitive therapy is effective for treating psychological issues, including suicidal ideation. And a new study shows that it's effective for preventing suicide, even when it's done through self-study web-based counseling. All right. So um, I did not know this before I read the study, but about one physician commits suicide every day in the United States. Apparently, consumers aren't the only ones unhappy with health care. Doctors don't like it a lot either. Interns are at particularly high risk. Suicidal ideation in increases by 400% during the first three months of internship. So researchers looked at the efficacy of a web-based cognitive behavior therapy program for prevention of suicides in medical interns. 191 interns from various specialties were randomized to one of two groups. One group participated in web-based CBT, the other participated in a control group. Those in the CBT group completed, on, completed online modules every week for four weeks before their internship started, while those in the control group received emails with information about depression, suicidal thinking, and local mental health professionals. During the internship year that followed, 12% of the medical interns who participated in web-based CBT had suicidal ideation during at least one point in time, while well, almost twice as many, 21.2% of the interns assigned to the control group had suicidal ideation. The authors concluded, the study demonstrates that a free, easily accessible uh, web-based CBT program is associated with reduced likelihood of suicidal ideation among medical interns. Prevention programs with these characteristics could easily be disseminated to medical training programs across the country. Well, these programs could easily be disseminated to the general public everywhere, too. CBT is cheaper and more effective than traditional psychiatric care and drugs, and studies have consistently shown that the recidivism rate for patients who undergo CBT are very, very low, while psychiatric care almost always turns people into chronically ill patients requiring ongoing drugging. The public would benefit from less time with psychiatrists and a lot more time spent in effective therapy like CBT. All right, that's all for today and for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who th you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you Tuesday with more news.